We'd like to welcome you to our second talk this year in our Writer, Speakers, and Ideas series. Uh, in a couple of weeks, on Wednesday, October the 17th, our next talk is by Dana Berry from the University of Texas, and she's giving a, a talk on the sole value of American slavery. And it's going to examine how slaves weren't just used to work in fields or in factories, but also how they were valuable in terms, for owners at least, in terms of collateral for loans and other uh, ways besides just work. So, but today we're here to talk about America and its role in the world. Commentators frequently call the United States an empire, occasionally a benign empire, sometimes an empire in denial, and often a destructive empire. Our speaker today, Elizabeth Cobbs, asserts that because of its unusual federal structure, America has performed the role of umpire since 1776, compelling adherence to rules that gradually earned collective approval. Her book, American Umpire, offers a powerful new framework for reassessing the country's role in the world over the past 250 years. Amid urgent questions about future choices for this country, her book asks who, if not the United States, might enforce these new rules of world order. Dr. Cobbs earned her PhD in American history at Stanford University. She now holds the Melbourne Glassic Chair at Texas A&M University, and she is a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Her books have won four literary prizes, two for American history, and two for fiction. Elizabeth has been a Fulbright Scholar in Ireland and a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. She has served on the Historical Advisory Committee of the U.S. State Department and on the jury for the Pulitzer Prize in History. Her latest book from Harvard University Press, The Hello Girls, is the defining account of the first women to serve in the U.S. Army for the Signal Corps during World War I. But today, she's here to talk about an earlier work, a work that has uh, direct relevance to our world, uh, American Umpire. So let's give a nice Lone Star welcome to Elizabeth Powell. Well, I am so impressed. I just can't believe this kind of turnout. And it's just a wonderful thing. And I want to thank Dr. Barr especially for organizing this event and so many events for all of you uh, on such controversial and interesting topics about which people often you know are afraid to talk and um, what I want to talk today is about a subject which I think reflects our division as Americans and I think sometimes we're so divided and you, you think why is that and I think part of it is because of a, a failure to kind of understand who we are and so we argue about who we are is our flag the flag of freedom or is it a flag of oppression? You know, and, and so what happens is sometimes I think there's a kind of self, um, you know, self-hatred that Americans can get into. We think that we're either perfect or we're just like the worst thing possible, rather than realizing that, like ourselves, we're just we're something of we're, uh, some of all of that. Um, I, I, if I lose my keys, I don't say, "Oh, you horrible, horrible, horrible person." Although sometimes I do, but uh, <laughs> for the most part, you go, "No, you know what? We all make mistakes." And so I think that what happens with in the United States is that in the last 30, 40, maybe even 50 years, I was talking with Rosemary Cuellar, who's helped to set this up, about her feelings about Vietnam and how hard it is for her to read a book about American engagement in a war because of her fear about how that war will be talked about and the, and the soldiers who went to that war and, and the sort of spiral that gets going on that. Now, lest you think I exaggerate, um, just a few years ago in 2015 at a, at a college in, the, uh, in California, a group of students who were on the student body voted to take down the American flag in their student center because they said the American flag was a symbol of colonialism and a symbol of oppression, and therefore it would be offensive and make diverse students uncomfortable. Now for the woman who's talking with one of these students, she says, wait, our flag is the reason for your freedom, that you can actually say these things. And so these people found themselves in a way unable to talk. Now by the way, it's very easy to blame the students, and these are the group of students who were on that student council, and to say, what's wrong with them? 
How dare those students criticize the American flag? Well, you criticize something if that's all you have heard, right? If you sort of believe that maybe the best way to love our country is to loathe our country. Because if I criticize myself enough, I'll stop losing my keys. Well, you know, <laughs> life doesn't really work out that way. And so the conversation has become so polarized that it's like up is down and backwards is forwards. To give you a sense of this, just a few years ago, President Obama echoed something that President George uh, W. Bush had said maybe three years earlier. And he said, the notion of an American empire isn't borne out by America's current policy. We seek a world where nations do not covet the land or resources of other nations. OK, he said this. And the very next day, it was quoted, more or less summarized, by someone else who said, President Obama basically came out and said the United States is an imperialist nation, and we are going to do whatever it takes, or we'll do whatever we need to conquer areas to take resources from the world. Now, I know you can see that, like, wait, did, didn't he just say the opposite there? Yes, but it got twisted around so quickly. Um, and why is this? Now, what I want to do now is just run through kind of a series of uh, to, to, so again, lest you think I'm just sort of like, maybe she's sort of uh, you know, hyping this up. In fact, the idea that the United States is an empire is students and adults are told all the time, fairly directly. Um, so uh, this is a book actually by a colleague of mine um, at Stanford University, Neil Ferguson, Colossus, The Rise and Fall of the American Empire. De, uh, Richard Immerman from Temple in Philadelphia, Empire for Liberty, A History of American Imperialism from I know you're not going to see, see this coming. Ben Benjamin Franklin to Paul Wolfowitz. Among Empires, this is a Harvard University professor. Uh, American Empire, uh, this is a Boston University uh, emeritus professor, Andrew Basevich. Uh, Empire is a way of life. This is kind of the granddaddy of them all. This is from like about 50 years ago. And this is a thesis that your professors would tell you, yeah, that I, when I went to school, people would talk about that. Empire is a way of life, or the tragedy of American diplomacy was his first book. Uh, this is a much more philosophical run at the subject, a book just called Empire, because what else do you need to say? And of course, the assumption is we must be talking about America. Another more positive way of looking at this, Irresistible Empire. This is about America's conquest of, yes, Western Europe. Uh, the Empire Trap, this is about US foreign uh, relations with Latin America primarily. Now, some people think it's actually empire is a good thing. And they say the United States is an empire in denial. We just ought to embrace it. You know, just go ahead and be an imperialist. And this is a fellow from UCLA. Uh, the American Empire and the Commonwealth of God. There's some people who say actually American religion is also an example of our imperialism. Here's another version of that, Christians in the American Empire. Now, by the way, very few of these accounts ever say, well, let's sit back and say, do we really have an empire? It's mostly assumed uh, in most of these books. Or workshops of empire. Now, lest you think this is just is not just about politics, this is about the creative writing projects, uh, programs in you know in American universities during the Cold War. So that was the workshop of empire. And by the way, I'm a native Californian, so I take particular umbrage at this because this is about surfing and the American empire. Empire. So in other words, everything we do, no matter what we do, no matter what we're talking about, I mean, there's going to be one on American cosmetology at some point, and we'll all be talking about American cosmetology and the American empire. So I mean, just it's, I'm, I'm sort of saying, I think it does get to absurd lengths, but part of that is because of the assumption of like, well, what else are we going to call it? This, by the way, is the sort of grand, uh, you know, this is the trilogy. It sort of reminds me of uh, like Lord of the Rings or something. This was a very famous American author named Chalmers Johnson, who a few years ago about, wrote a whole trilogy on the American empire. So you can, you know, get the whole thing start to finish. Now, by the way, you might think, okay, all right, so, you know, what's the problem with that? Maybe it's a useful form of analysis. It does make us look harder and things we ought to look hard at, which is our mistakes, right? Because we do make mistakes. It's important to understand them. Uh, and so some people say, so don't even bother about it. Just continue to let that roll along. But there are, there are consequences, and sometimes the consequences are very dramatic. Um, there were a couple of young men who a few years ago went around talking to their neighbors in Boston about the American empire and how terrible this American empire was. And these young men engineered an explosion at the Boston Marathon as a result of that. Now, I'm not saying they read any of these particular books. What I'm saying is that there's a, an assumption here that the United States, if you, you know, 
buy into that way of thinking about it or think that there's, it's reasonable, it very quickly can be turned into something that's like saying, you know, just put a kick me sign on my back because I accept that actually all our country is is an imperialist nation out to oppress others. So that, those are serious charges. And if they're true, fine. But if they're not true, then it's really important that each one of us look at that and think about it. Now, by the way, I'm not going to dislike you if you say, you know, I like all those books. I think your book is ridiculous. Fine, you're going to have lots of company. And that's the great thing about a university is that we can discuss these ideas without, you know, scorning one another because we think a, a, a way differently from somebody else. That's the beauty of a place like Lone Star. So what I'd like to do is just give you this sort of a real quick thumbnail sketch because you're going to probably, some of you would be saying, but you know what, I, you know, I think, I think we are an empire and I, I know I've heard this. So let me give you the three basic arguments for why the U.S. is an empire. Now, by the way, there are some more, but I'm just going to give the big ones so we don't have a lot of time. One is that the United States expanded across this continent and we <coughs> stole all this land from native peoples. The United States went to war with Mexico. Well, so did... Texas go to war with Mexico, in other words, and this was this rapacious land process. Now, that is true, right? That is all true. So the question is, how do you think about that? Is that a form of empire? And actually, I think this is important to understand this, that is actually nationalism, which is a different word, a different concept with a different application. How do we know that? Well, first of all, because kind of like everybody was doing it at the time, I always like to bring up Chile. Right? Because we don't go around talking about the empire of Chile, Chile the great oppressor, etc. cetera. Uh, in the War of the Pacific, um, Chile in the 1870s, I think it's, uh, I'm forgetting the year right now. Um, Chile, as you see in the, on this map, was a fairly small country. And Bolivia had some coastline. Well, that did not last. Because Chile, like a lot of new nations, like the United States, like Mexico, butted up against other countries when these borders were still being decided at the, after the end of the Spanish Empire and figuring out where do, where do I start, stop, and where do you start? And so this was a brutal process, by the way. Uh, that, by the way, not only in which republics like the United States and Mexico or Texas and Mexico conflicted with each other, but they also conflicted with native peoples. Um, the uh, great wars of the desert, by the way, in Argentina, when they talk about that, what they mean are the wars against the native peoples. Um, and this gives you a, a, a picture from a, a Spanish language um, book about those wars, because that was happening in Canada, in Australia, in South America, in the United States. And this is not to absolve anyone of the horrors of that process but just to say this was a very common process in the 19th century and even into the 20th century. Um, do we go around calling all those nations empires? The empire of Australia or Canada or Chile or Brazil? No, we don't. And you're scholars, so you need to think hard about definitions because they're important. Another secondary reason why people call the United States as an empire is because of its wealth. Right? And the United States is today one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And we look around and we say, wow, did, did I get that? Did we get that? Because we stole from other people and we oppressed them. And our economy is, dom is dominant because we used our great power to sort of either hoodwink or pressure other people and, and force a terms of trade on them that robbed them and improved us. Well, one of the problems with that is that it tends to rest on this notion of America pow Americans' power in the 20th century. Uh, and also the, its military power. But the United States, as this map shows, was one of the most prosperous countries in the world by 1890, and in fact, had the world's largest economy by 1890, before the United States entered into a single foreign war, meaning going outside of our hemisphere. The United States had more railroad tracks than all of Europe, and that wasn't because we were an empire. The third reason why this is also often alleged is because of United States bases all around the world. And this kind of funny looking map, uh, it's not a great map, but you know, I wanted to bring up one of showing where are American bases abroad and people throw out all kinds of numbers, hundreds and hundreds of American bases. And by the way, most American troops are abroad are in five countries, um, stationed permanently, South Korea, Great Britain, um, uh, Italy, Germany, and Japan. There are small American bases elsewhere. Sometimes, by the way, these bases have as few as eight or 10 people. So 
The other thing, not only are those bases often not really large, some of them are very large, but in all the cases where there are large bases, guess what? They are there because the host country has made that bargain. Now these are not tiny countries that can't stand up for themselves. These are Great Britain. You know, these are, as I said, South Korea, Japan. These are countries that ha have made that choice. And sometimes, by the way, now a real empire, first of all, I send you my troops, they stay, you don't ask, you, you know, they'll stay regardless. A real empire will not let itself be kicked out. It has to be defeated, right? Because that's kind of what it means, any normal usage of the word. Well, the United States, one of our biggest bases used to be in France. And in 1967, the reason why this says on this book cover, 1850 to 1967, is because they said, Yankee, go home. <laughs> and the United States went home. Now, by the way, that's happened before as well. I mean, since then, uh, the Philippines asked America to withdraw their bases um, at a certain point as well. Now, did the United States go to war with any of these countries? No, we said, oh, OK, you know. Bye, and we withdrew. So these kinds of things don't really add up to any, any common sense definition of empire. So if you want to use the word, then it's because you want to use the word. And then we have to think about, maybe you'll write about why, why that is the case. Now, by the way, this, however, I know some of you may be thinking, but doesn't America have a special role in the world? Because you're right. There is something that, you know, where we keep going out and intervening militarily and sometimes with terrible consequences. Because sometimes we just make a totally stupid choices about where to go and when to go. Have you ever made stupid choices? Yeah, yeah, I have. So, you know. Um, but there is this sense, and so we're trying to say, well, why is it that the United States feels that we must do it? Now, as Ronald Reagan said, he quoted the Pope, and the Pope said, my gosh, hard to you know, go against the Pope there. Anyway, but the Pope said the American people have a, a great genius for splendid and unselfish actions. So sometimes America actually gets kind of volunteered by others. We volunteer ourselves. And others also do encourage us to volunteer. That has happened since, uh, well, since World War I. Uh, uh, President Clinton said something very similar when he said, we remain the indispensable nation. So what do people mean by that? Now, by the way, you know, when you think you're indispensable, that is sometimes a problem. I, I'm a parent, by the way. If I thought of myself as indispensable all the time, this would be so obnoxious to my children. And in fact, it has been at different times. Um, so, you know, in fact, we, we go overboard sometimes, you know, the whole Rambo notion, right? You know, the world will fall apart if we are not there constantly making it behave. So sometimes there's a kind of egotism there, too. So we, that's what I'm saying. We, we're kind of divided, like, are we super great or are we super awful? Well, what I want to uh, argue now is that not only are we an, not an empire, done that, but we also tend to overestimate how much we need to act in this role of umpire. Um, and partly it's because we don't recognize the ways in which American values or actually world values. I don't have to make you not do X, Y, Z because you don't want to do X, Y, Z, right? When we share values, it makes it more possible for us all to cooperate with each other. So how did American values and world values become actually fairly similar? So I want to go back much farther. I want to go back way back. Because many values are things that humans have evolved over millennia. And this isn't a map of this spread of agriculture. Now, we don't have to go around the world saying, you will farm. Now, <laughs> people will say, no, I, we farm because it turned out to be pretty awesome for us all. So the Neolithic Revolution began in the Middle East. It spread worldwide. Today, we all eat bread, right? So, so some things, some values are about humans learning from each other. A similar transformation happened beginning about the 1770s with the start of the Industrial Revolution. Now, again, we don't go around the world saying, you know, you will make things using machines. And sometimes people don't want to. You know, sometimes people want to knit, right? <laughs> so you might knit or make food, you know, the hard way and never use a food processor or microwave. But the point is, is that overall, we all accept machines and we're not requiring each other to use things. That is, by the way, brings us right up to the present with things like, 
Artificial intelligence and iPhones. You do not have to make people buy an iPhone. They will line up around the block. So this value of you know, agriculture, the value of technology, these are things that are really worldwide values. And there's another value which has spread worldwide with, by the way, sometimes consequences that are just as problematic as having too much technology in our lives. And that's the value by which nations replaced empires because humans not only are materialistic creatures, but we're also in a way philosophical creatures, right? We have ways that we relate to each other that change over time. And one of those ways is how we think about government, what we think of as being legitimate. And what happened after about 1648, I'll tell you about that in a second, going all the way to the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991, was the gradual falling apart, sometimes in big chunks, sometimes in lots of little pieces, of the great empires of the world. It's just, I'm not making this up. It's, a, it's pretty self-evident that nation states replaced empires. And in fact, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was something like 50 nation states. By the end of the 20th century, because this process speeded up over time, there were almost 200. Today, there are almost 200. How do we get all those little teeny tiny nation states and why? And why do we just like, why don't the big ones go around eating the small ones anymore? Because we don't believe in it. As a world, we don't believe in that anymore. It's not that people don't try, because it's sort of like any kind of law, right? You know, I'll pass a law and you're like, ooh, maybe I can sneak around and break that law because for some reason I want to. But the point is the overall structure of of humanity has accepted this idea that nations are better than empires. It does go back to a very specific moment, the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648, the guys in the you know, long dresses, et cetera. Um, and this was the period after the end of the wars of Ref the Reformation in Europe, where basically these wars were so bad, they were so awful, and it was all about religion, like, you know, I'm Catholic, you must be Protestant. No, I'm Protestant, you must be, you know, I'm, whatever. The point is that people were fighting over these things, and they finally said, listen, this is gonna go on forever unless we just finally agree that every country gets to decide its own affairs. I'm not gonna go conquer you to make you Protestant or Catholic, vice versa. Instead, I'm gonna let you make all your own stupid mistakes <laughs> and nations do to the present. And that was the beginning of this falling apart of the idea of empires. There were some also some other things that have emerged, and these are more, more current than the, what I call the Republican Revolution, meaning the, re, the replacement of republics and nation states for empires. There was another process that got going that very much is uh, allied with the history of the United States. And these are sort of values that are very, very American. Now, I could have said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which are very American ways of saying these things, but then that tends to make it sound like it's just us. And it's not really just us at all. So I call, instead of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, I talk about access, arbitration, and transparency. Access is basically the idea that we all be, ought to be able to walk into this building, right? None of us is going to be told, you can't walk into this building because of your color or your gender or your whatever, you know, national background, et cetera. So free markets. Openness, that is what access is about. And that's a value that's really spread around the world. Now, not everybody agrees all the time, but it's the predominant value. Arbitration, the notion that we should talk about things rather than I'm just gonna pull out a gun and kill you, right? Rule of law. And lastly, transparency, the notion that it's really actually works better if we are just open with each other about what the laws are, about how they will be enforced, about, you know, you know, the, how our companies run and all that kind of stuff. Now that's sort of, you know, without going too deeply into it, that's the sort of basic idea. Now how do we know that those are not just American values, that if we want them to prevail, we have to go out with our guns and make people do these things? Because we don't, really. Okay, we know they've prevailed, some, like the, the principle of access to gun is this idea. One way to talk about it is free markets or open political processes. Adam Smith of, of Great Britain, the Scottish, actually, a Scottish philosopher, articulated this. By the way, coincidentally, his important book, um, uh, which I'm blanking on the moment, came out the same year as the American, uh, I know someone's going to tell me in a second. <laughs> and, uh, same year as, um, as the American Revolution, uh, 1776, Wealth of Nations, that's the name of the book. Now, by the way, so that was a Scottish you know, philosopher hundreds of years ago. The head of China 
uh, in the 1970s said, you know what, this whole closed economy thing, that's not working for us. We need to have access. So how do you have a communist country that basically has a capitalist economy? Because not the, the United States did not win any war with the Chinese. The Cold War was actually still going vis-a-vis -vis Russia. But this country, large country, decided on its own that to give people access to e economic opportunity would work out better for them. Because they could see that countries that did that prospered more, and they were tired of being poor. So access is a value that has spread, regardless of political manipulation, certainly regardless of any attempt to impose it on, on others. The other rule I said, arbitration. Um, a good example of that is the formation of the United Nations. There are all kinds of international forums now where people get together and say, OK, instead of just having like a war against each other, how about if we sit down and talk about it and create a new rule? And so the principle of arbitration has also spread around the world. And transparency, I'm sure some of you have studied the Cold War, and you may recall that one of the first things that the Soviet leader did who initiated that process, Mikhail Gorbachev, was to say, we need um, glasnost, which means transparency. Now, by the way, has Putin re uh, re you know, backpedaled on some of that? Yes, and humans are backpedalers all the time. But the goal, the notion that we will actually be better, we will function better if we allow our people access, if we follow rules, if we are transparent. You can read any newspaper in almost any country around the world, and you read that newspaper for a week and you'll find somebody complaining about our government is not transparent enough because it's a world value and not one that we have to impose by force of arms. Now, this does, however, take us back into this role of the United States as an umpire. So the United States, however, if you set up any rule of law, right, So, because we talked about one of these principles is arbitration, which means we have rules. So that setting up any rule will therefore trigger the need for enforcement. Because we, right, if we're going to agree that it's a rule, there's going to be somebody who sometimes inadvertently will break the rule and sometimes will deliberately break the rule. And this was a problem that the United States itself, when it was founded, grappled with. Because they knew that, like good Westphalian treaty people, that they had created a bunch of states, autonomous states, which got to make all their own stupid mistakes without anybody beating up on them, right? That's the no that was the notion of sovereignty. And so one of the great conflicts when our country was founded was, OK, you know, how do I square the circle or put the you know, square peg in the round hole? How do we protect the sovereignty of all these little states, but at the same time, get them to obey rules? Because we're not an empire. We're not Britain. We're not going to come in and say, this government is going to make all the rules for everybody. No, it was every state got to decide a lot of stuff all on its own. And in fact, they would get together and make up rules. But what happens when doggone it, Vermont <laughs> starts breaking the rule? By the way, you think I'm joking. There's actually was a war between Vermont and New York, you know, and like, so, you know, this is not, and Virginia. Don't even get me going on Virginia. So, so this question was dealt with by the founders, not under the Articles of Confederation, but under the US Constitution. And so they created this government where a federal government could get together and tell states, oh, you know what, you stepped out of line, and all the rest of us are going to make sure that you live up to your agreements with everybody. I mean, after all, you mostly signed on for these rules anyway, right? So when the Federalists, uh, the people who wrote the Federalist Papers, were trying to justify to a lot of, because by the way, about half of Americans did not want the Constitution. So I know we're all today like, oh gosh, I thought everybody loved the Constitution. No, it's like, ha well, it's <laughs> like most things. Half the people love it, half the people hate it. Anyway, so John Jay and Alexander Hamilton and James Madison wrote a series of articles. By the way, I'm a big fan of Alexander Hamilton, so I'd like to point out that he wrote the vast majority. But anyway, they all three got together and they wrote this series of papers. And they used again and again this term. Because when I was started to write this book, I was talking with a group of students, and I said, you know, I just don't buy it. I just have read and read all these books telling me the United States is an empire. First of all, they often contradict each other, which is you know, not a good sign that there's a real understanding of a concept. But also, I just think the evidence doesn't stack up that way. 
I said, if anything, you know what? I think the U.S. is not an empire. We're like more like an umpire. Uh, you know, we kind of try to call the rules, and then we get back out of the way, and then the game goes forward, and sometimes we make a bad call, and sometimes we make a great call. If we make a bad call, one team will love us, the other team will hate us. If we make a good call, one team will love us, and one team will hate us, because that's the way it is being an umpire. It's never very fun. And then I was so surprised to go back to the Federalist Papers and read that. Hamilton said, in conflicts between the states, the federal government acts as an umpire or common judge. Because otherwise, by the way, neighboring countries, meaning neighboring states, are naturally enemies of each other, like Vermont and New York. Now, by the way, that used to be the absolute given assumption of the world, that the person who is most likely to go to war with you was your neighbor. Because who's going to steal your bike? The guy next door, right? <laughs> people conflicted for resources with the people with whom they would otherwise divide those resources. John Jay, lesser known, but he said in disputes of law or practice, the umpire would decide between them to compel acquiescence. In other words, make them behave. James Madison, what better umpires could be desired, desired than representatives in Congress? So this was a role that the United States government undertook in relation to its own states. Now, by the way, that all sounds kind of nice, doesn't it? Well, we also had a civil war because there was a moment in which the federal government said, no, you are breaking this rule and we're going to make you behave. So I'm not saying umpire is easy. I'm not saying it's painless. I'm not saying we all love the guy. I'm saying it's a more accurate way and actually more historical way of thinking how we related to ourselves because this was the first government, one of the first governments, the only one I can think of in world history, we're neighboring, we're neighboring nations, neighboring states, on a basis of perfect equality with each other, got together to try to have a, a kind of coalition whereby they could you know, peacefully inhabit a territory together. So then you might say, well, yeah, but OK, all right, that's 1776. What about now? Well, what about now is that since World War II, the United States has taken on a position that in some ways is not the same. Now, by the way, in history, things are relatively always the same. But there's a lot of there are similarities with the role that we play abroad with the way, way we play, role we play at home, which is that we're not trying to, one state can't conquer another, right? Vermont can't have New York. New York can't have Vermont. But um, so they're equals. But there's always this process of how to make sure they don't go to war. And so Na uh, the NATO, which is the North American Treaty Organization, this is its headquarters in Brussels, you know, has the American flag flying out in front of it. Now, you might think, and sometimes I've even read in history books, well, when the United States created NATO, oh, way back, back up here, <laughs> because this was actually called the West European Defense Alliance, basically, and it was a creation of of Great Britain and Belgium and some other countries, which at the end of World War II were really worried that they'd get perhaps conquered by the Soviet Union. Hitler was gone, but the Soviets seemed aggressive. And so the United States was encouraged to join a defense alliance. The United States said, no, thank you. And that was Harry Truman. But then the Soviet Union pressured, sort of invaded Czechoslovakia, and the US said, OK, we'll do that. And so the United States volunteered and was volunteered for this role. Now, in some ways, it remains kind of a weird role for us. The United States is certainly one of the most, the most military interventionist country in the world. That's just a fact. We send our troops more places than anybody else. When things go really haywire, no one says, where are the Mexican Marines? They just don't. Or the Canadian, although Canadians have sent a lot of folks out. But there's not this sense that is anybody else's special responsibility. So why is it ours? It's especially a little odd because we're not really that big. Okay, We think we're big, and we're actually one of the largest countries, the third largest. But if you look at us in population, I mean, we're like puny next to China, puny next to India. Uh, the European Union has you know, quite a bit, few more people than we do. This is obviously from 2014, but the numbers don't, haven't changed that much. If anything, you know, our size relative to others diminishes over time, especially because of the population of India. Um, and yet, we continue to spend more on defense of world values, defense of world security, than any other country. Um, so by the way, these show the expenditures. This is not labeled very well, but these are military expenditures. 
and how many billions of dollars the United States spends on world security and national security. But by the way, when we say national security, that's a little bit of a funny word for us. You've all heard it, right? No, no, we, what we spend on national security. You have to understand that something like 85 to 90 percent of money that's spent on national security is to protect shores other than our own. You know, our troops are somewhere else doing what they do. They're not here in, you know, on the Gulf of, you know, they're on the Gulf, they're not in California. They're, they're defending the nation by defending other people. And it's a, you know, it's a tidy sum. Now, does this buy us lots of great things? Does this make us sort of like the Romans, the most you know, wealthiest people, the most healthiest people? No, and in fact, in many ways, the United States, uh, we find ourselves in an odd position of, in terms of education, in terms of things like life expectancy, we're actually pretty far down when it, in comparison to other uh, wealthy countries. So if we are doing this just for our benefit, then like we're really stupid, because <laughs> we haven't noticed yet that there are actually some costs to the whole affair. So um, now, by the way, of course, some of this is because other countries do depend on us. Um, this is a picture from a while ago, because it shows the former prime minister of Great Britain, uh, David Cameron. He says, our position on defense has not changed, which is we're hanging on to the coattails of the United States. Now, by the way, this became an issue in the last election. And uh, candidate Trump made the point that Americans uh, pay much more towards NATO than other countries. This is true. And this has been true for a long time. And this is a criticism that has been made by many people. So the question becomes, how do we deal with that? You know, one way, of course, is to simply say, we don't care about alliances. We don't need alliances. Um, I don't believe that. Um, but I think it's time to start thinking about what we do need to spend money on. So this is actually, I was on a show in New York. Should the United States keep bases in countries like Germany and Japan? Now, by the way, I usually, when we argue about military stuff, we're usually talking about Iraq or Afghanistan or some intervention, Vietnam, to go back to what Rosemary was saying earlier. And that's what we argue about. But actually, the majority of our military expenditures are, you know, or at least ongoing ones, are in countries that we defeated in World War II and yet continue to have us there. So I'm not saying we have to withdraw these bases, but I think it's time to think about how to create a more equal relationship with the rest of the world. And so the last thing I want to do, I'm getting through this so that some of you can get going. Um, one of the things I did fairly recently was the book that I wrote on American Umpire was made into a film for PBS. And um, so if you want to see this film, you have to go on Amazon Prime. Pretty, pretty easy, right? This is your conversation. You know, I'm much older than most of you. Uh, so this is, you know, this is your country. Uh, and the question is, what kind of country have we been? What kind of country do you want to be? Uh, I think that one of the reasons why we do get asked, sometimes volunteered, and sometimes we volunteer ourselves the role of umpire, is because we are the, almost the only country which has been doing a kind of umpiring for more than two centuries. Right? We understand that states, nations, must respect one another's differences and wishes and their right to make their own laws. And at the same time, we also do understand, we have this kind of almost in our DNA, this understanding that there have to be umpires. Now, of course, I mean, why did the United States become it? Well, because of this experience we have, but also I think because other countries, despite everything that happens, trust us more than many others to perform this role fairly well. Now, one of the reasons for this is because of our big oceans. You know, we don't have any neighbors we're itching to take over, and mostly, you know, we buried the hatchet with Mexico. We've always had a pretty good relationship with Canada. There's not that kind of push up against other countries that you see elsewhere. And so I think that this idea that the United States has not only the experience, but also doesn't have the same motivation and the same need to oppress other countries that um, that might be the case, you know, in the case of China or in case of Russia or other countries which simply just don't even want to take on that burden. So uh, I think that the, the last thing I just want to say is that um, how we understand our past helps to determine what we think are our choices for the future. If we believe, if we accept that we're some kind of quintessential empire that we must oppress countries because otherwise somehow we're, we don't, we're no longer ourselves, 
then that kind of breeds not only a really destructive self-hatred, but it also gives us absolutely no choices. You know, if we thought sort of as Marxists would say, for capitalism to survive, the wealthy must rob the poor. Well, then your only solution is to get rid of capitalism altogether because, you know, that doesn't seem like really a good way to go in life. Uh, or if you say that the only way America has to oppress other countries because it's an empire and that's somehow quintessentially who we are, then the really only, the only answer to that is the answer that has been given by people like the Tsarnaev brothers who blew up the Boston uh, Marathon, which is death to America. So not only do I believe that that's not a good solution, <laughs> But I also think it's an absolutely unnecessary way of framing our own national history. And that if anything, our history shows, going back to the first of our founding days, that the United States has always acted as an umpire and not an empire. Thank you.